Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Well, verse 13, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We covered that last week. For it is God working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. I forgot to ask if Dick is ready. You all right? Because I can back up and start over if you weren't, all right? He's good. Hallelujah. So, it is God working in you. He creates in you. When you let God work in you, he'll create in you the will and the, to do what? To, he, he works in you both to will and to do. He creates in you the will and the activity to do Hallelujah, his good pleasure. In other words, it, God's working in you is to bring you to the place where you fulfill his word and do what his will is. Okay? And um, Jesse, go on my desk and get my readers. They're, they're, they're turtle, tortoise shaped, tortoise colored. I, I, can't, I can't do these. They're, they're so foggy I can't even, they're messing with me. Hallelujah. Woof. It's not the glory, it was just the glasses. I wish it were the glory. That would be great. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> but it wasn't. So we're just going to have to have to go with it as it is. Amen. Philippians 2. 2. Let me, let me, do, let me see if, my, if I can get them bigger on my iPod here. Nope. Well, praise the Lord. Should I have to show it to the readers? I can't see a thing up here real good. Where is it? Where are we? So he says here, it's both God who's working in you both to will and to do. Thank you, sweetie. Huh? I can still see better. <laughs> All right. Hallelujah. Glory to God. For it is God that's working in you both to will and to do. His, God creates you both to will and the desire. See, God on the inside of you will create both the will and the desire to do his good pleasure. Amen? Hallelujah. That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke. How, where? In the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Now, church, I am so, uh, I, I don't want to be ugly, but I am tired of the church thinking that becoming like the world is love. If you love God, you will hate what God hates. God hates sin. He, he, he loves the sinner. He hates sin. Throughout the scriptures, God, you know, there's things that the Lord does hate, and one, uh, see, six things that the Lord hates, and the seventh is an abomination to him. There, God hates sin. And so to think that love loves and condones what God hates is not love. Can't be love. We live, and as, you know, Paul writing this here in his generation, and, and you think about the era of time they lived in. They lived under the occupation of Rome throughout the, throughout the world, and Rome was, was a homosexual com, uh, society. Homosexual, pedophilia, a lesbianism, perversion of all types. That's what the Roman society was. And uh, they lived in the midst of that. And I find it interesting, one of Paul's strongest statements against homosexuality was in the first chapter of the book to the Romans. Yeah. Yeah. See, see, people say, well, you know, we didn't consider homosexuality normal until the 18th century or 1820 or 30 or something like that. And, wait a second now. The Romans considered it normal? And Paul wrote in the middle of that and said that men let the natural use of the woman and burn in the lust one toward another, working that which is unseemly. When he gave, God gave women of vile passions... Women leaving the natural use and burning their lust one to another. God's word does not, you know, so that it is a perverse lifestyle. The, the generation is perverse. We live in a crooked and perverse. Um, and the word perverse comes from a Greek word that means misshaped. It's not shaped right. It's, it's wrong. 
We live in a generation that calls evil good, good evil. Hello? And so we're, we're living in that. We're seeing that. The church is now coming under persecution. If you, if you don't want to marry homosexuals, they want your tax exempt status rebuked. They can call you all kinds of names. It's not a hate crime because you're a Christian. If you say the same, if you use uh, the like terminology towards them, it's a hate crime. They're beating up, you know, they, 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 a couple of years ago they beat a pastor or, or, or some people up who at a, at a pro-gay rally, the gays beat the daylights out of a couple of Christians who were, who were there protesting their protest. The tolerant crowd. You remember the tolerant crowd? The one that's full of love? No, 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 nobody was there beating any gays. Huh? No, it just got posted. It was two years old. Yeah, people posted like it was happening yesterday. It was two years old. Okay? It's a couple of years ago. But the fact of the matter is this. You know, we're living in a generation that calls evil good, good evil. It's crooked. It's perverse. It's misshaped. That's where we are right now. Things are happening. I mean, you know, uh, now however you feel about the Confederate flag, Dukes of Hazard just got taken off of um, the, the, that channel. TV land because they got Confederate flags on the car. They just took it off the air. They just took all Confederate flag memorabilia out of the Gettysburg Museum. Not museum, uh, store. Store at Gettysburg. That was the battle, people. We're rewriting history. You know, you can't go to Gettysburg and get, and listen, can I say something real, real just so you understand? Northern states had slaves. There were at least two or three northern states that were slave states. And they were not required to give up their slaves. Can I really bust your bubble? Abraham Lincoln had slaves until the end of the war. We're making something. See, society is making things happen and rewriting history and saying things that's not accurate. Why? Because they want to rewrite and revise history and, and keep revising it until... The truth is no longer findable, no longer discoverable. And they'll rewrite it in their image of what they wanted to say. They've already tried to rewrite it, but we're not a, we've never found there's a Christian nation. There was no Christian ideology. They tried to say that, that Washington was a deist and that Jefferson was a deist. And I think something just came out the other day proving that Washington was not a deist. Okay? But they're trying to say, what's a deist? They believe that they're a supreme being, but they didn't believe he's a Christian God. You know, you know it's a pluralistic mindset. Any, anything could be God. They're trying to rewrite history. We're living in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. You know, if you get to put the Ten Commandments up, the Satan worshipers will come and put up some Satan symbol on your, on your state lawn. You wait. They'll go after the crosses and menorahs on the, on the cemeteries at Gettysburg and in La Jolla and California and anywhere that, that is, you know, p uh, public ground. That they're they're going to go after it. We're living in the middle of that. Now, I'm not saying it make you afraid, but just get rid we're, we're in the middle of it. We've never known persecution before in America. Not really. I said, not really. I mean, somebody might call you a Bible thumper. They'll oh, hurt my feelings. You ain't seen nothing. They're coming at you with everything they got. They, they, they believe the Supreme Court ruling has loosed them to go after the churches with everything they've got. It's never been about gay marriage or gay equality. It's been about stopping the church from having a voice. And persecuting the church. It has been a tool of the devil from the beginning. And you Christians who are rejoicing in it are stupid. I don't know what else to say. You're just stupid. Bible illiterate. Dumbos. Or you ain't even saved. I don't know how I can make it any plainer. Except your SOS. Stupid on steroids. It's time the church stop acting dumb. Now, but you're supposed to be in love. I do love. See, people who won't tell people the truth damn their souls to hell. They hate them. The true people of love warn people in love. Listen, I love people. I'm just telling the truth. There's a devil and demons released to bring things into operation in our country. But listen, you, you think that your children learning about how to engage in homosexual sex in the fourth grade is good for them? That's in the co common core curriculum. And this is the stuff that you're, you're going to filter down in your school systems. And you're going to see because this community has an agenda. And they're using the courts to push it. 
We live, everybody say this, we live in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. That's where we're living. So what do we do? Well, we, we can't go out and shoot people. That's not love. And it's not God. Amen? Okay. Where am I? First chapter 2. So we, we are without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Church, you're not supposed to be condoning. You're supposed to be light. You're not supposed to well, I love people. That, no, that, love, that love you're talking about ain't cutting it. Putting your little picture up there with the gay flag over top of it ain't cutting it. Coming back with the Christian flag over your picture ain't cutting it. We must be sharing the truth. And the truth is God loves you. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to condone what everybody was doing. No. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now remember, Paul writes and says we're confessing him as Lord. Amen. There's a, the, the word of God goes on and says be holy as I'm holy. The Bible says be imitators of God as dear children. We are to hate what God hates and love what God loves. But Jesus did not come to condone what men were doing. He came to redeem them from their destructions and miseries and bring them out and establish them in righteousness. Now, that's your opinion. I don't know. It's not my opinion. It's Bible opinion. It doesn't matter what I think is righteousness. It doesn't matter what I think is sin. What does God's word say is sin? And we have to come back to the place that we are light. We share the truth. We can't act like the world and be like the world and condone the world and win the world at the same time. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Would Jesus ate with publicans and sinners? He did not eat with them to be like them. Yeah. Yeah. He ate with them to share the truth with them, to be the light to them. The woman caught in adultery. He didn't condemn her. Yeah, and he told her to quit sinning. He did not condone her actions. Matter of fact, he's probably mad at the other guys for only bringing her. Because if she was caught in the very act, she won't by herself. There was somebody that left out of the thing. She wasn't going to make her pay the penalty by herself. No, you know, ghost, don't, 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 yeah, look, I don't condemn you, but don't stop sinning now. God loves the adulterer. God loves the fornicator. God loves the homosexual. God loves the thief. God loves the glutton. God loves the, the, the uh, temptress. God loves the murderer. God loves, uh, you know, all the kind of sins we can think of. That's why he sent Jesus. He sent Jesus to redeem them from their destructions. He sent Jesus that they might have life and have it more abundantly. He did not send them to keep them in what they were in. That is the lie of love. That is the lie of the mantra of the world's concept of, the love, of God's love. They believe, or they don't really don't believe it. They know it. They just, on the inside they know, but it's a good argument to get away with what they want to get away with. It, cover, it allows them to sin and, under the guise that it's okay. Jesus did not come. Look, if we were to stay the way we were, God could have loved us from heaven and left us just like we were. He would not have sent Jesus to die on the cross to take the nature of sin, the perversion of sin, on his own body, on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness. He wouldn't have had to send Jesus if he was going to leave us like we were. That would have been no effort. He could have just said, okay, guys, send it up. I still love you. That will never change. Now he got so bad, he wiped the whole bunch out except for Noah and his crowd. Like one guy said, isn't it, isn't it amazing that the, the homosexual community takes the sign that God won't judge the world again with a flood as a covering, you know, and a, and a celebration of their sin? Actually, you know, the problem is the next one won't be with a flood. It'll be with fervent fire. The next judgment will come in fervent fire. So, anyway, Christians... Jesus came to save that which was lost. He did not come to condone and to, and, 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 um, and to 
seal in the state of being lost the sinner. Repent carries more meaning than simply changing your mind. Or it has a depth to it. it the change of, of thought, the change of actions that rep reflect what God has done in you. You know, God, in other words, you repent for being sinful. And you change and, and your actions now represent the godly sorrow of the repentance that took place in your heart and acceptance of Jesus Christ. Now, the, you know, at, right after all this came out, homosexuals have been on crosses, you know, uh, mocking Jesus and, and you know, and all the stuff that they de demand that the uh, church do. So they're mad at the church. Why do they hate the church so bad? Yeah, but here's quick, another question when, on all this. Why aren't they at the, over at the mosque demanding they marry them? Why aren't they over at the Buddhist temple and demanding they marry them? Well, the Muslims come out and cut the head off. That's just the way it is. They'll just go out and cut the head off and hide. Are you here? Now, just the church of Jesus Christ. Why? Because we're telling the truth. We're telling that you can be saved from that. You don't have to stay in that lifestyle. You can be free from it. Even in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, we are to be light. And Christians, if you're not being light, you're a deceiver and you're sending people to hell. Everybody likes me because I put my little gay flag over my picture. Really? Really? You think that's love? Hello? That's not love. All right. He says here, so, um, whom you shine as lights of the world. This is the next verse. Holding forth the word of life. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. We're to hold forth what? The word of life. The word of life. We're to hold forth the word of life. We're to give the truth. We're not to, we're not to hide the truth. We're not to run from the truth. We're not to be, you know, um, deniers of the truth because it makes people happy. I think your scripture is about men liking you and stuff. I think Woe B's going there somewhere. Hello? We want everybody to like us. We want everybody to think we're cool. We want everybody to think we're hip. You know, that we've, we've come of age and we're intelligent. So what we're saying is, we're more intelligent than God. Jesus didn't say anything about, you know, homosexual marriage. Really? He said that God, that God made a male and female. And he said, for this cause a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. He, and then 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul writes, the man shall, shall um, give due benevolence to the wife and the wife to the man. Didn't say anything about man to man or woman to woman. Hello, and look, the Corinth church was a messed up church too. Now, there's a lot in the Bible. And I, I told y'all Sunday there's this little thing going around on Facebook about, you know, that uh, this pastor said to his congregation that homosexuality is a sin. There's a few scriptures that say homosexuality is a sin. But there's a lot that say divorce is a sin. And those who are divorced say that you're supposed to stun the woman, but there's nothing stated about the consequences of being a homosexual. I thought, you lying dog. You lying worse than an old hound dog on the front porch on a hot summer afternoon in July. In the same book that you want to quote about the woman being stoned, it says if a man lies with a man that's with a woman, he shall be put to death. They shall both be put to death. It's an abomination. So don't tell me the Bible didn't say anything about it. Paul wrote in First Corinthians, I mean in Romans chapter one, he said that the that uh, that the man who does that, they'll give it over to reprobate minds. I also said when the man lies with the man, they, they receive in their bodies the just recompense of their reward. So don't say there's nothing in the Bible. The Bible goes on in other places listing uh, several sins, but homosexuality is one of them. They will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. So just because somebody puts it on Facebook, you know, it don't make it true. It's just, it's kind of like that, that, that uh, sloppy, slob guy showing up, the girl's waiting for her blind date, and he's French, he's a French photographer, and he comes walking up, and he looks like the biggest slob you've ever seen with a camera around his neck, and he walks up and goes, bonjour. She said, he's French. because I, I know it's so because the internet said it. You know? The other, what's the other one said? Uh, Abraham Lincoln invented the internet. Yeah. Has to be true because it's on the internet. You know what I'm saying? 
Just because somebody quotes, quotes the Bible and puts it, I don't mean they've quoted it accurately. People will lie so much because their means, the end justifies their means. But what are we to do? We've taken our stand. We know what's truth. We know what's not truth. We know what is a lie. We know what's not a lie. We know what God has ordained. We know what God has not ordained. And a bunch of, a bunch of people in robes don't to overrule God. That's just the way it is. Texas just went and told all their clerks and all their pastors and everybody, you obey the First Amendment first. Make that a priority. You have the right to freedom of religion. And can anybody make you violate your religion to do something you don't agree with? So they basically told them, he issued, he issued an ordinance or executive order from the, the governor's house that you don't have to obey the ruling from the Supreme Court because you've got a First Amendment right not to. Just because it's legal don't mean you've got to do it. Hello. But what do we do? Now, call it, calling homosexuals gay, calling them fags, calling them perverts, calling them reprobates, calling them a whole lot of things we probably wouldn't want to say from the pulpit is not going to help. We are to hold forth the word of life. We are to say, just like to the adulterer and to the fornicator, that your lifestyle is reprehensible for God. It is sin. It will send you to hell. You must repent and turn from it and, and walk away and be saved through Jesus' blood. And you cannot live that lifestyle and expect to go to heaven. God loves you enough that he sent Jesus to pay the price for your sin and to make a means whereby you can escape that sin. He did not come to condone your sin. So when we hold forth the word of life, we must be telling people what the word says. Christians, you do not have the right to violate the word of God under the guise that you're walking in love. You have, an, you have a command from the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we're to preach the truth. He told, he told, uh, he prayed to the Father and said, sanctify them, talking about humanity, through thy word, thy word is truth. We are to hold forth the word of life to humanity. And it doesn't matter what the government says. It doesn't matter what a magistrate says. One city in, Oakland, in Idaho has passed an ordinance that if pastors do not per perform gay marriages, they're going to arrest them. Under what law? Under what right? Somewhere in Idaho. Now, the 27th page of the opinion by, by Kennedy states that person, religions and persons of faith are still permitted to um, passionately pursue and speak against homosexual marriage. That their deep-seated beliefs they're still able to act on. So that, there's an out already. If somebody tries to sue a pastor for not doing it, there's an out already. The, the opinion states that I can continue to stand my ground. Cannot be forced to violate my religious beliefs just because the government said you could get married. It just means I don't have to do it. And I'm not going to do it. And pastors, I'm telling you, you will answer to God instead of holding the word of life to people, you're holding a, a humanistic, uh, damnable lie to people and helping them engage in rebellion against God. You will answer to God. And I'm going to tell you, pal, woe be to anyone that calls any of these to stumble. Well, you're angry, but I'm not sinning because I'm telling the truth and I mean, I mean it with heartfelt love and sincerity. You cannot continue to preach a lie when you're called to preach the word of life. And life to the sinner is turn from your sin, turn from your iniquity, turn to God. Jesus will wash you of your sin. He will deliver you from the power of sin so that you can walk in righteousness and true holiness. Well, I don't view such what I do as a sin. It doesn't matter if you view it as a sin or not. If God's word says it is sin, it is a sin. I think it's all right to fornicate. Well, pal, I'm going to tell you something. You're going to get in trouble. I think it's all right to commit adultery. The Bible says adulterers won't see the kingdom of heaven. Right there in the same list with the homosexual. So if you think you can live an adulterous lifestyle and go to heaven, I'm not a hate monger, but I'm telling you, pal, you will burn. And I prefer you not burn. I prefer you turn. I have a sermon. 
Try, fry, shake or bake, turn or burn. We need, you need to turn to Jesus. You need to shake loose to the things of the world. Yeah, I don't want you baking. I don't want you frying. And I don't want you uh, burning. Are you here? I desire you come into the kingdom of God and be free. But you're denying me what I want. You know, but the lust of your flesh are not what God has created you to. God did not create you to fulfill the lust of the flesh. And the lust of the mind. Amen. The lust of the eyes. Or the pride, the pride of life. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. He didn't create. They're destructive. They bring you into damnation. They bring you into, uh, they bring you ultimately into hell. Jesus came to deliver you and to pay the price for the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And we in the church are to preach what the word of life says. Well, the word of life has stipulations. One is turn, believe, and act on what the word says. But you're a hate monger. See, I'll just hate, say, just throw the church. You're a hate monger. You're a bigot. Oh, dear Lord. The biggest bigots out are the ones living in sin and accusing the church of being bigots. Why? Well, because we don't accept your sin. I don't accept you uh, molesting children as normal. It's perverse. I don't accept you in a relationship with the same sex as normal. It's perverse. I don't accept you sleep with somebody else's wife as normal. That's perverse. That's wrong. Sinful. Hello? I don't accept you sleep with every woman you can find as normal. That's, per that's wrong. That's perverse. It's not normal. And all those things will send you to hell. So what do we do? We shine as light, but we, the light is in the truth. It is not in condoning sin. Love is not piling up and accepting the sin of people. Love is warning them of the consequences of rebelling against God. And it takes love to do that because people don't want to hear it. And they'll mock you and they'll persecute you and they'll lie about you. And they'll spit on you and they'll say all kinds of evil, man of thing, evil, man, evil things about you. But it doesn't matter. We are to be light and holding forth the word of life. Where? In this crooked and perverse nation and generation. We have a responsibility, people, to stand up for the truth. In love, but we have a responsibility to stand up for the truth. And we cannot be bullied by people with a lot of money who call you names. Oh well. Back in the day, Jesus said they'll call you, they'll bring you before magistrates. Amen. You'll suffer persecution for his name's sake. I'm telling you, our current president said he's got a lot more to do before his office is over. I'm thinking, dear God, stop him. He's done enough. I said he's done enough. Race relations in our country has gone down the tubes in the past six years. They're worse than they've ever been. They've worse been. They're worse than when I was a kid. They really are. Everywhere you go, it's It's terrible. I mean, I just went in the bank today, and, and, and there was a person, a different race than me, who was a teller, and treated me like dirt. And I'm up there going, hey, how you doing today? And being real, you know, cheerful and gentle. And they're, they're, they're treating me like, you honky? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you, Melanie. Melanie's going to go out and take them out. <laughs> Mess with my pastor. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, I, and, I, and it was so bad, I, I started to go to the bank manager and say, look, you need to deal with this. But I didn't. I just went on out the door. Told him, have a good day, buddy. You know, real cheerful. I'm like, are you kidding me? Son, you need to stop watching YouTube videos and listen to the media and start listening to your heart. I didn't come in treating you like you were my servant and you're a dog. I came in treating you like, like you know, you're my buddy. You know? I, I, was, I was upset when I left. I was like, I didn't do anything. All I did was come in and say, how you doing? I mean, they were just like, like, okay, okay. Thank God my, my flesh is on the cross. And every once in a while, they wants to get off, and I have to put it back up there. Take the nail guns and shoot it, and get it back up. Boom, 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 boom. Stay up there, boy. Stay up there. You don't want him to get loosed. Doesn't, no, no resurrections for the dead man. Hallelujah. 
Let me see if I'm going to get through here anymore tonight before we get too far gone. Holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I've not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered up upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also you do joy and rejoice in me, but I trust that in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you that I may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For they all seek their own, not the things which are Christ Jesus. In other words, everybody that he knows didn't have the care for them like, like Timothy did and he did. But you know the proof of him that as a son to a father, he has served me in the gospel. Man, we need more. I tell you what. Now, let's change gears about holding forth the word of life. And go, you know, now he's, he's changed gears here. Now he's talking about his son Timothy. We need more sons in the faith. We're not looking to jumpstart their own ministries and, you know, and, and stick it to the pastor and take half the congregation down the road. We need more men and women who are sons and daughters in the faith who will serve with a, a servant's heart and do the will of God in the church. And I'm not talking about our church, but I'm talking about churches. There are people that come out of Bible school, go into church, work six months, and they don't like something the pastor said, go down the road, they're going to take half the church and start their own church. You weren't a son. You're a hireling. As a matter of fact, as, uh, you're illegitimate. We'll stop there. Hello. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently as soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust the, in the Lord that I also shall come shortly. I suppose it necessary to send unto you Ephroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger, that he, he, may, he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you and was full of heaviness because he had heard that he was sick. For he indeed was sick, nigh or even close to death, but the Lord had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also upon me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and that I may be le the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such a reputation. Now, in other words, he's telling, I'm sending Aphrodite. He was so busy working and serving me, he near about died. He overexerted and overworked himself for the gospel's sake. I mean, he was giving it all to the point he almost killed him. And, and the apostle of God was merciful to him. And not only was he merciful to, to Ephrodite, he was merciful to me. Because I would have lost a good soul. I would have lost a good uh, servant in the Lord. Because of the work of Christ, he was dying to death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service um, toward me. In other words, they weren't able to be there to serve him. And so uh, Aphrodite said, well, somebody's got to do it. And he picked up the weight and began to carry it and actually carried it too much, so much so that it almost killed him. Okay? So Paul says, now, you receive him. You honor him. Okay? He's a true servant in the Lord. So he sent him to help out. And praise God. Amen? Hallelujah. So we have here, uh, as Paul goes through this chapter, he, he kind of he snakes through it. All right? Are you here? He kind of snakes through it, uh, talks about, you know, the name Jesus, the name of Jesus being above every name, talks about that we are to be blameless in this crooked and perverse generation, that we're, that we light and hold forth the word of truth or the word of life. And then he begins to talk about uh, sending Timothy and Ephroditus to them who were there, who were there to make sure they're doing okay and to check out their state. One, <clears throat> probably one thing is to go make sure they're not doing stuff that they're, they're not supposed to be doing. And, and in the process of doing that, uh, make sure they get everything cleaned up. Because Paul didn't come in there in immense words. Remember when Paul wrote to the church at Corneth and found out that there was somebody in the church who had shacked up with his stepmama? Now Paul didn't write and say, love them, accept them, condone them. He said, well, I'll tell you what, since you hadn't done anything about it, Here's what I'm going to do. Next time you get together, I'll be there in the spirit. And I'm turning them over to the devil to destroy their flesh, that their spirit will be saved in the day of the Lord. That's my love talk. Yeah. I'm just going to turn them over to the devil. Let the devil have his way with them. They'll repent. And then he writes back in 2 Corinthians, which is probably really 4 Corinthians. See, we believe that there was a letter before 1 Corinthians. Actually, we believe there's four letters to the church of Corinth. That's how Paul knew the man was living with his stepmama. The first letter. Okay, and they had written back. He wrote back and said something about it. Then there was another letter, because the fourth, the second Corinthians refers to a letter that doesn't have stuff in it that's in the, the, the first letter to the church at Corinth. <coughs> so we believe that there's probably four letters to the church at Corinth. 
in the fourth, in the second one, which is, could be the fourth one, have I messed you up yet? What we, what we can in the canon we call 2 Corinthians, he says, receive such a one back into the fellowship, lest, lest be overtaken with much sorrow. He repented. I said, see, the love of God had him turn that man over to Satan to destroy his flesh that he would be saved in the spirit and go to heaven. That's love. Love doesn't condone. Love brings first the correction. And if the correction is rejected, then it brings the judgment. What for? So that they can be saved in eternity. It's better to be judged here and go to heaven than to not be judged here and go to hell. In other words, you don't want to be judged afterwards and go to hell. Hello? You can't, you, I mean, you, you don't get a chance after that. And we're so happy tonight. So happy together. Oh, it's not a church song. Anyway, but we're happy together, aren't we? Hallelujah. All right, we finished here at second Philippians, uh, Philippians chapter 2. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.